the wizarding world of Harry Potter cast its spell over muggles around the world 20 years ago now. But for millions, it's an enchantment that's lasted well past the last page of the last book. Joining us now to explain their enduring fascination with this magical series and perhaps how they got over the disappointment of not getting an invitation to Hogwarts on their 11th birthdays, let's welcome, in San Francisco, California, Jill Kolingowski, assistant professor at College of San Mateo and author of the forthcoming book, Life Lessons Harry Potter Taught Me. In New York, New York, Melissa Anelli, author of Harry, A History, The True Story of a Boy Wizard, His Fans, and Life Inside the Harry Potter Phenomenon. She's also co-founder and CEO of Mischief Management. And here in our studio, Vanessa Zoltan, humanist, chaplain at the Harvard Divinity School, and co-host of the podcast, Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. And Matt Rocks, co-owner of the Lockhart Cocktail Bar, which has locations in Toronto and Montreal. And we are delighted to welcome you two here in studio and our friends in Points Beyond uh, in the USA for this conversation about a very important anniversary. And Jill, why don't you get, just get it started here and tell us how you first got involved in the Harry Potter series. Sure, well, I was, I think, 12 years old, one year older than Harry, and my sister handed me, um, she had read the books first, and so she handed me the first book and said, you gotta read these. And so I read the first two. The two, first two were already out when I was young and couldn't put them down ever since. Melissa, how about you? Actually, the same thing. Like all younger siblings, we read what our, what our sisters give us, and my sister, <laughs> put that Harry Potter on top of my last year of college books with the indication that I needed something lighter to read, and I <laughs> fell in love. Vanessa, how did it come to you? I was in my 20s, and the guy I was dating, like, insisted that I read them, and then it became a choice at a certain point. He insisted you read them, or else what? I, I made him read, you know, my favorite book, so this was, like, a fair exchange, and I it paid see. off. Okay, so. good. Matt? For you? Um, I was on holiday on the west coast of England, somewhere near Shell Cottage, I like to think. And um, my aunt handed me the book. Um, and again, just couldn't couldn't stop reading. It became a tradition every year. The rest I go on holiday history. and just have my hoodie up on the beach reading. <laughs> hoodie up on the beach reading. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. OK. Jill, uh, I'd like to know what, um, what in particular spoke to you that made you get hooked on this and obviously be unable to put the books down? Great question. Um, obviously, Harry himself, I think the fact that he's an unlikely hero, you know, truthfully, Harry is sometimes not that great. And I think that's a hero we can all love. It's not a superhuman, just someone doing the best that they can. Um, and obviously, as a kind of a nerdy, bookish girl, I mean, Hermione, I think, is, you know, the love of my life. So <laughs> those two really spoke to me. And Melissa, how about you? Did you find the, the averageness of Harry's heroism to be a, an appealing feature as well? Yes, and also the the incredibly intricately plotted nature of the text. I've always been a mystery fan. And not only were these endearing and wonderful characters I wanted to spend more time with, but I was dying to figure out the mystery, and it, it really fueled it. Vanessa, how about you? What spoke to you in particular about the books? They're incredibly intense. You know, I feel like up until the very end, you don't know if Harry's going to live or die, and the stakes just feel so high in the books, it's, you know, about racism and torture, and, and then with these very endearing characters to walk you through. It's... But you knew if it was seven books, you knew he was probably going to make it to at least book seven, right? At least book seven, but you but... don't know the whole time and how he's going to get there. Matt, how about you? Um, I think originally probably the sense of escapism, um, but there were also aspects that you could relate to, I guess, which was kind of fun for a kid. And then I just liked that it kind of readership grew with the books as well, and the books kind of adapted itself towards that kind of aging readership. Which You're really a liked. very soft-spoken person. Matt. I know that. I'm, yeah. I have been told that many I, times. I, I'm just thinking our audio person right now is probably pulling his or her hair out. Me. I would assume. I'll try, I'll try and be a little bit more clear. <laughs> you may have to project just a tad more. Enunciate. Uh, let's get into uh, this notion, which I hear over and over again, which is that the Harry Potter books literally saved reading for an entire generation of people, that had they not come along, a whole group of young people might not be reading books at all today, or so certainly not in the way that they they have. Jill, does that resonate for you, that notion? I mean, it does. I'm a professor now, and so I hear that a lot from students. I mean, not not for me personally, because I was always uh, a reader, but you know, I'm an English professor. I've read all the great classics, and I always say I don't think I'll ever love reading a book as much as I loved reading the seventh Harry Potter book, just the culmination of all that joy. And I don't know that that will 
be replaced again in our lifetime. So I think it does have this cultural importance, both for readers and for people maybe who are hesitant. Hmm. Matt, would you be as much of a reader as you are if not for the Harry Potter series? I, probably not, to be honest. I think it was my gateway into literature. Mm -hmm. I read Tolkien after that, and I read, you know, and I, I, I just always have a book in my hands now, you know, and it's kind of just led me to, it's a very kind of easy in, you know what I mean? It's very, it's a very, you know, yeah, it's just a very easy in, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I Melissa, you told us you first picked up the books when you were a little kid, and I, I, I wonder whether or not, now that you're an adult, you continue to read them. Do you pick them up and read them over and over? Well, I was actually I was actually in college, but um, we've. Well, to I, me, that's I, a kid, Melissa. Sorry. To, I agree. <laughs> At this point, I agree. Um, no, I was a I was um, actually just started a full reread of them on our podcast Pottercast. We just started from chapter one for the 20th anniversary, and it's such a delight to go right back to the beginning. I've delved into them a lot in pieces, but it's been a while since I've really just started from one and gone straight through. And there's just such magic to it. Vanessa, how about you? Have you read them more than once? I have. I've read them all twice. So I read them once on my own, and then we started teaching uh, Harry Potter's sacred text class, and so I got to read them with the class. And now with the podcast, we read them chapter by chapter. Um, and so now I'm only halfway through book three, but I read each chapter multiple times to prepare, mm. and it's amazing how it bears up to scrutiny. Like, it just, it really holds up. The language gets more fun, more things reveal themselves, the more intimate you get with the text. Can you recall whether you actually appreciate them more now that you're older wiser, et cetera, or whether you appreciated them more when you were younger and, I mean, admittedly in your 20s, but still perhaps able to, you know, dive in in a different way. I think that I appreciate them more now, but I just met a five-year-old who was read one and two by his parents and then snuck read three and four. And the joy that he <laughs> has for these books, first of all, I, it's so impressive to me that he could do that. But the joy that he has for these books, I think, is unparalleled with the joy that I will ever have, having come to them a little bit older. I think kids can relate to these books in a way that I probably missed. Hmm. Jill, how about you in terms of how many times you've read them? Oh, countless times. I actually have Sorcerer's Stone in my bag right now. I was reading on the train on the way here. Um, you know, countless times I used to read them every summer as kind of a source for comfort. And for the Life Lessons book, I was reading them and taking really intense notes. So I was transcribing a lot of quotes and then typing them up and really looking at them from kind of a, you know, literary analysis lens. And same, th I felt the same as Vanessa. I really kind of appreciate the intricacy and the complexity of the books as an adult. But I do think there's something about being a 12-year-old and reading about a 12-year-old that while I love, I think I appreciate them even more as an adult, I don't think I'll ever be <laughs> that 12-year-old kid again, but I still, you know, live with her in my heart, <laughs> so. Well, that's it, Jill. I wonder, you, I mean, you, you can't really read at the age you are now with the same wonder that you would have when you were 12. That's fair to say, isn't it? Correct, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. And therefore, do you feel something is lost uh, in translation the older you are when you read them? I mean, no, because I think there's a transformation. Like as a kid, I read them and identified with the kids and how unfair it was that no one would listen to them. But as an adult, I'm reading them from the perspective of the adults and kind of appreciating the difficulties um, that they experience and the ways that you know they are involved with you know the resistance movement and the ways in which they're maybe not. And so, I don't think it's lost. It just changes. And I think. Both things still exist. Like I still love reading Sorcerer's Stone. I say it's my favorite because I get to reread that joy. You know, I went to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter just in October, the one in Florida, and you know, I cried when I saw the Hogwarts Express because it was so sweet. Um, so I guess that 12-year-old is still there a little bit. Hmm. Now, Melissa, of course, the fact that we're 20 years later and these books are still being read by the multiple millions suggests that it's not just a thing for a particular generation. This clearly has been able to cross over into multiple generations. And again, for those who may be curious about the series but have never read a book or don't know much about it, why the enduring popularity in your view? I mean, I get asked this question a lot, and it's a great question. It's one that's a little hard to answer, but it is, it's an epic story. It's like all the great epic stories. It has every, it's like all the best art, it's about all the most important things in life. It's about life, it's about death, it's about how we live, how we love, how we're friends, how we choose to be in the world. It is, in the end, about all of these things and there is 
not a person alive, it doesn't have the power to touch if they're reading it with an open mind and heart. And so I think it's an instant classic. Matt, what, uh, what in your view would you add to that in terms of why the books are still so enduringly popular? I think, as you said, I think the themes are, you know, enduring over time. I think they have relevance, you know, especially now in terms of our, you know, political themes, I think, have you know, tolerance and, you know, I guess subversion in a way have a certain, you know, um, resonance now. I think, you know, you can really relate to that any kind of, at any stage in, like I know, like five years ago, there was relevance in terms of, I guess the same things, like just the themes that she kind of goes with. And I think, I think that's, you know, one of those, yeah. Not to fun and dick and Jane it too much, but I mean, it's good versus evil, it's love, it's, I mean, all of those universal themes are there, aren't they, Vanessa? Absolutely, yeah. and you know, there are all sorts of lovely statistics about it. It's the number one most requested book in most prisons after the Bible. It's the mm -hmm. most requested book even in Guantanamo Bay after the Quran, so I think that the other thing, I is the ubiquity of it, right? You want to read it because your friends know which houses they're in, and you want to read it in order to be part of a community. So I think that the popularity begets popularity, and I think now adults are really excited to read it with their kids, and that love of it is infectious. I'm going to follow up with you because your Twitter handle is HP, Harry Potter, mm -hmm. Sacred Text. Yes. Okay. I need to understand better about how you came to start reading Harry Potter as a sacred text rather than as a book for young people. Yeah, so um, it started, I was in divinity school and I'm interested in um, how to get young people back into religious spaces and how to change religious spaces for, the, for millennials. And um, I think that treating something as if it was sacred is hard. This goes to what you're saying too. It's in, um, in rigorous and I think it's good for us to be asking big questions and wondering about our places in the world. And so um, why not do it with a text that's already beloved and that's easy to read? And so Harry Potter with its popularity and it's so good, I think that it invites these sacred experiences. As Jill was talking about, people read it every year as a source of comfort. There are people who read it, you know, on the anniversary of their father's death. They'll read a certain scene every time they go through a breakup. People have already ritualized Harry Potter. There are, there are like Mecca sites, right? Again, mm. as Jill was saying, there are traditions and tattoos. And I mean, there are so many things that so, people are already treating as if it was a religion. In this, uh, that's the point, I guess. In the same way you'd go back to the Bible to read certain passages exactly. over and over, it's happening here. Jill, would you go so far as to say that there is a sacredness, a sacredness to the text? Oh, of course. I mean, I love, I'm a big fan of Vanessa and Casper and their podcast be, for that reason. And I think that's why it's become so popular is because it is a source of comfort. It's a source of inspiration. It's a source of joy. You know, I read, I just started rereading them again after um, the U.S. election, which I found upsetting. And I just had a student of mine die kind of traumatically. And I found I couldn't really stand anything else. And so that was just an immense sort of, of comfort. Even though the books are not always happy, I think, there's a kind of, it is, it feels like communion. It feels like going back to your friends in a way, for sure, sacred. Hmm. Melissa, have you ever thought of them as sacred as opposed to just a publishing series? Absolutely, and it's a shared text. It's a thing that, like Vanessa was saying, the ubiquity makes it something shared. So it's part of an experience that most people have together now. And so you get to, to relate to each other via this amazing metaphor, via this amazing story, just like all the best stories. Hmm. Matt, your c connection to this, I guess, you, you run the Lockhart Cocktail Bar. Now, Lockhart, for those who don't know, do you want to explain what the connection there is? Um, I mean, it's... I mean, the, the, in the name? Yeah. Or, I mean, the name is, you know, an obvious reference to Gilderoy Lockhart. Um, it's an obvious reference if you've read the book. Sorry, yeah. If I you haven't read the book, it's not an obvious <laughs> reference. Sorry. So but, who's Lockhart? Um, he was the um, much maligned uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher in okay. the second book. And do you find something sacred in the business that you're in as it relates to I Harry mean, Potter? I, the business that I'm in? Um, I mean, for me, the books were always an anchor home. Um, so it's kind of, you know, I'm not from Canada. Um, so it was always, I traveled a lot. So it was always a, a thing for me. I listened to the, the audio books a lot. Um, like I just listen to Deathly Hallows right now. I like drive a lot, so I'm always listening to them. And it's always for me, it's a, I'm homesick if I'm, you know, feeling a bit lost. But also if I'm mm. at the same time, if I'm feeling, you know, happy, it's something I would, you know, celebrate by 
I can't sleep if I'd not listened to Stephen Fry lulling me to sleep with a, <laughs> that a would passage be cool. from the book. Good. So, We asked each of you to pick a passage from the entire series that speaks to you in a particular way. And I should ask, do you all know these off by heart or should I read these out for you? Or is that a dumb question? Of course you know them off by heart. <laughs> Vanessa, do you want to get us started here? Do you know the passage that we're talking about? I think so. Okay. So um, my favorite chapter is obviously the most depressing one. So um, when <laughs> Harry walks to his own death in the forest again in book seven, and there's a beautiful moment where Harry um, whispers into the snitch, which is this ball that he's been carrying around from his mentor, and he says to it, I am about to die. And after he says that, his parents and his godfather and mentor, all come, who are all dead, come out to keep him company. And there's a beautiful line, their presence was his courage. And um, I'm a, a hospital chaplain in training, so, um, and I'm a chaplain at a university. So the idea that just being there with someone and being in community with someone can give them courage is, I think, a very chaplain-oriented thing. And it's something that grounds me in my life and my work, that I don't have to think of the perfect thing to say to someone, but sometimes we just need community. Here's the line. Beside him, making scarcely a sound, walked James, Sirius, Lupin, and Lily, and their presence was his courage, and the reason he was able to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Nice. Speaks to you, obviously, very deeply. Yeah, I love it. Okay, Melissa, let's go to you next. The passage that you picked <laughs> is, I am not worried, Harry, said Dumbledore, his voice a little stronger despite the freezing water. I am with you. Why did yeah. you pick that Harry one? Goes well, Harry goes through this incredible journey in these books, and it's sort of a continuation from a, a previous conversation he had with Dumbledore, where Harry fully starts to realize what Dumbledore means when he's going on and on about love, and why it's love, and why love is going to make him into the warrior in this fight that he needs to be. And it's sort of the moment that Harry fully grows up, and fully becomes the person who's gonna power through to the end, and become the hero and save the world. And it's just such a turnaround moment with Dumbledore, who's always saving the day. He's the one who comes in, Deus Ex Dumbledore saving everybody, you know, for a couple of books now, and this turnaround was just so beautiful for me. Hmm. Nice, okay. Matt, ready to go here? Yep. Here's your passage that you picked. And now, Harry, let us step into the night and pursue that flighty temptress adventure. Yeah. Just looking at you, I can see why that one would have resonated, but go ahead, tell us why. I mean, I think it's, I mean, in the terms of the books, it's at the start of uh, The Half Blood Prince. Um, I think there's a nature of the books, that kind of swashbuckling adventure nature that often gets overlooked, I think. Um, that kind of really sums it up. I think also it's a good, you know, just lesson. I think you kind of, you know, it's, you don't know what's ahead of you. And I think there's like a nature, uh, kind of an element of that in Harry Potter is that there's always stepping into the unknown. And I think Dumbledore is just trying to imbue Harry with that kind of confidence to step forth. And Dumbledore at this point knows he's gonna die. So it's kind of like, there's an element of stepping into the unknown for him as well, t in terms of death. So. We probably should have said 20 minutes ago that uh, if you're not a Harry Potter aficionado, spoiler <laughs> alerts, you know, all the time throughout our discussion tonight. But anyway, I guess it's, I guess it's a bit late for that. Jill, let's get you on the record here as well. Here's the passage you picked. Differences of habit and language are nothing at all if our aims are identical and our hearts are open. Remember. If the time should come when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy, remember what happened to a boy who was good and kind and brave because he strayed across the path of Lord Voldemort. Remember Cedric Diggory. Okay, Jill, why that one? Oh, there's so many. I have to say Melissa's is one of my absolute favorites as well. Um, for that one, I mean, I think it can talk about this idea of innocent victims. You know, uh, Cedric is kind of an innocent victim, and I think Dumbledore in this moment, he's calling for unity, and he's saying that, you know, it's easier to kind of fade into the shadows, and what Harry does right after this is insist to everyone that Voldemort is back, and that they need to listen, and that they need to do something about it, and so he's kind of invoking this idea of protecting others um, and sticking up for what you believe in. Um, and Cedric also, you know, he chooses to grab the cup with Harry, even though he could have been kind of the lone victor in this moment. So I think there's, it works on two levels, both it can be talking about unity and um, doing, in, in all cases, doing the hard thing and, you know, doing the small kind thing when you have to, even when it's not easy. So that always, I think is a lesson we need to learn over and over again, for sure. Okay, this is the point in the program where the host has to acknowledge 
as I did when we did whatever it was, the 25th anniversary of The Simpsons. We did a program on that, and I had to acknowledge back then that I'd never seen an episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> and here's where I fess up. I've never read one of these books, these Harry Potter books. And even worse, I don't think any of my kids have either. So I'm not only a failure as a person, but as a parent as well. <laughs> so. No time like the present. Get when on I ask, uh, yeah, oh, <laughs> you know what? The summer's coming up. Maybe I'll take a crack at one of these things. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions here that I have no idea what they mean, but I'm sure you all do, and so you're going to help me through this. Okay, Melissa, you with me here? I'm there. Melissa, what is the Leaky Cauldron? Oh, it's the magical pub between Diagon Alley and the Muggle World and the Magical World. It's also the website I've been running for, you know, 15 or 16, 17 years about Harry Potter. Okay, and what role did the online communities play in the whole Harry Potter phenomenon? There's literally no way to explain the Harry Potter phenomenon without attaching it to the internet phenomenon. The internet really came of age in 1999. That's when it hit about 100 million users, and that's kind of a benchmark for when something becomes ubiquitous or at least inalienable from life, like the TV and the radio before it. And in 1999 is also when Harry Potter exploded. There were three releases. There was one in England. There were two in America. The, the phenomenon was really picking up speed, and social networks were where the fans who were waiting breathless for the next book were gathering to theorize, to write fanfic. And so this internet invention sort of fueled and poured gasoline on what was already happening, which was a fandom in progress. It was really the first one to test what the internet could do with that. There's, they, are, they are part and parcel of each other, the internet and Harry. See, I remember the days, Melissa, when, for example, Star Trek, which came out in the late 1960s yes. and then became a huge thing after that, and all of it happened without any internet at all. So I, yes. I do so wonder imagine whether... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, imagine a giant cliffhanger between two episodes of Star Trek, and then there's three years, and suddenly a way to connect people worldwide to talk about what's going to happen between these two episodes. The mm. fire that that creates in terms of interaction is hard to contain. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Jill, let's try this one here. Uh, how significant a part of your Harry Potter experience are the online discussions? You know, I think I feel shame in admitting this, but for me it was small, and that's because um, I felt very kind of privately in love with Harry Potter. I found I kind of didn't want to share it. I didn't go to a single midnight book release. I mean, I got all the books and I read them immediately, but I read them, you know, with my family. We would talk about them. I did, I was aware of the message boards and I looked at them, but I felt a certain hesitancy in participating because even though those are my people, I felt kind of so privately that Harry Potter was mine. Um, so this idea of talking with other people like Melissa and Vanessa is actually kind of new, and I have to say, I wish I'd done it sooner. I wish I hadn't been kind of so protective of it. You know, it felt it felt so personal. It felt like the books were written just for me, and so I found I was I held them very close, and I almost didn't want to be a part of it. But Melissa, I think I'm I can, coming a little too late. Sorry, Melissa. <laughs> if I can make the comparisons again to Star Trek, they again have taken on a new life because of conventions, yes. and I guess that's the same for Harry Potter. And you know about that. Tell us about that. Uh, Absolutely. In 2009, my company, Mischief Management, started LeakyCon, which is the big Harry Potter convention, and we've been going strong ever since. Our next one is over Labor Day in Dublin, and thousands of Harry Potter fans, actors, creators, everybody that's done something creative around Harry Potter comes together to celebrate. And it is like, it is like Disneyland for book lovers. It's such a wonderful place. <laughs> okay, we're going to show... Uh, Sheldon, you ready for this? Should we play this tape right here? This is something called the sorting hat, which of course I have no idea what that means, but uh, you will all explain it to me once we roll this clip, which Sheldon will do right now. Thank you. When I call your name, you will come forth. I shall place the sorting hat on your head and you will be sorted into your houses. Hermione Granger? Oh no. Okay, relax. Mental, that one. I'm telling you. Ah, right then. Mm, right. Okay. Gryffindor! <laughs> Okay, so that's what a sorting hat is. I get that now. But these houses, what, what are the houses? The houses are Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff, Gryffindor, and Slytherin. And um, you get sorted into a house by this magical hat, and that becomes sort of your common ground, um, where your dorms are, who you eat with, who you compete on behalf of. Do you belong to a house? So I'm 
in a phase right now where I'm anti-house sorting. I think it's... <laughs> I, I agree there. I yeah. sort of think it's the original sin of the magical world. And I think that um, a lot of people feel a lot of affinity with their houses and a big sense of home with them. And I obviously think that that's wonderful. And it's certainly a wonderful shorthand when you meet a kid. You can be like, what house are you in? And their faces light up and they're like, I'm in Ravenclaw. But... Um, I, I think that at the end of the books, you still, still see this enmity between Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter, these two rivals throughout the books. And this is even after war, they haven't come together. And it feels like that's very much about their houses. And it ends with Harry having a conversation with his son, who's scared that he'll be sorted into the wrong house. Mm. So- um, Feels very cliquish. Yeah, and it feels, it, it doesn't feel like it's, it, I mean, it feels like commentary on the way that we live in the world, you know, about um, racial differences and socioeconomic differences. I think it's an important part of the books, but... Um, well, I think we have a couple of house friends out of town here. So, Jill, tell me, what's your view on the house situation? You know, I, I agree with Vanessa, um, I think, and I mean, I think to me that's part of the reasons why they, I love the books and continue to love them is that they keep making these mistakes and I think there's this sense of that good will always triumph and even though we'll keep making these mistakes, perhaps like sorting into houses, we'll continue saying it's me versus you. Because um, I think to me the battle against Voldemort is, you know, good versus evil, but I think that's actually more about fighting the good, or I'm sorry, fighting the evil within yourself. And I think this kind of insisting on difference is is part of that. Um, on the other hand, you know, I feel a very strong Hufflepuff pride, so I'm kind of of two minds about it as well. I grew up saying, oh, I'm this house, and then as an adult, I kind of, you know, identified maybe a little bit differently with a different house. So mm. I can see, I can see both, you know, there's that, because that's the the sense of belonging is a major characteristic that Hogwarts provides for a lot of the people in the books, but I do think there's a danger in that as well. Melissa, you belong to a house? Oh, I'm a total, total Gryffindor, but Vanessa, I we need to have like a four hour podcast about this specific <laughs> right. topic. Anytime. I just, I'm bursting with thoughts right now. <laughs> Matt, uh, besides the Lockhart cocktail bar, do you belong to a different kind of house? Uh, Hufflepuff, but I think they're the most inclusive house, which is what kind of why I, I oh gravitate towards them. And it's not, you know, it's not about certain characteristics I think you have, except for hard work. It's more about, you know, like if you feel belong there, they're going to, you know, take you. And I think there's a bit in the song about Helga Hufflepuff that kind of, she says she'll take, she'll take them all and, you know, treat them just the same, which I think is kind of nice. Vanessa, where does this urge or need to belong to a house come from in the first place? Well, I think everybody wants to belong to a home. And I think, you know, Harry grows up abused and um, his parents are both that he's being raised by his abusive aunt and uncle. So it makes complete sense that the Gryffindor common room and feeling a part of Gryffindor house means a lot to him. Um, but Harry's a very interesting character. The Sorting Hat has a very hard time sorting him. And it's actually his desire for a sense of home and the fact that he's already become friends with the Weasleys, who are this like great Gryffindor family, that he begs the Sorting Hat to put him in Gryffindor. So I, I think we all want that sense of home. Um, hmm. And yeah, a sense of belonging, right? People who know you and are looking out for you and... Gotcha. We just got a few minutes left here. Let me put a couple of more issues on the table. Uh, Melissa, I want to go to you on this. You've met JK, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, a couple of times now. Had an opportunity to interview her as well? Yeah, I've interviewed her three times. One was for my book. We did a two-day, eight-hour interview about the phenomenon of Harry Potter, and she was so gracious and so wonderful. And I always say, you know, I used to be a, a reporter, and um, when you're a reporter, you learn pretty quickly that not to put too much faith in people you've admired from afar, but J.K. Rowling has never let me down, not once as a person. She is as awesome as she seems online in all her various pursuits. Good to hear. Uh, Jill, yeah. uh, let's tackle this one. She has been present, J.K. Rowling I'm talking about, has been very present on Twitter in the last couple of years, adding, I guess, other quote unquote facts to the story as we go along. So th this is a living, continuing story, I guess, is it not? Yeah, she, you know, she has this whole, she's been writing a lot of short stories, so she's been writing about this American version of Hogwarts. Um, I admit to being kind of resistant to it, although I think as a writer, I admire her. I mean, you know, I would die to meet her, frankly, but um, I do feel a certain loyalty to the original series. Um, but I, I'm also for the series evolving. I mean, I think that's part of the journey people take with these books is that people will take it one direction. You know, with my book, I'm hoping people read it and disagree with me because I think, you know, everyone will take these books as their own in some way. Um, so I think, 
you know, let it grow. I'm for it. Vanessa, what's your view on, on how she has added to the story on Twitter? Well, I think that um, we, on, on the podcast, we've decided to treat the seven books as sort of canon from a religious point of view. Mm -hmm. And then Twitter um, is sort of the midrash or the, you know, depending, it's commentary on the text. And I think it's really interesting. It's not what we're choosing to engage with as if it was sacred. And I think to Melissa's point, like this is an incredibly exciting thing with the internet. Like this is not something that Tolkien ever had the opportunity to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's so cool. Like now we have a black Hermione, right? Like it's, I'm not sure that Harry Potter as it stood is sort of, is progressive enough for the next generation. And I think it's so exciting. So we have a queer Dumbledore and we have a black Hermione and like these are things that I, I think just enhance the world in really positive ways. Melissa, what's your view on it? You know, when people complain about J.K. Rowling adding to the world, I always tell them to imagine themselves as the creator. Why would you ever tell a creator to stop writing? Nobody told Tolkien to stop writing, you know? Readers are, t are free to interpret whatever they want to, whatever pieces they want to in their own way, but no one should ever tell a writer not to write. That is a nice way to put it. I want to thank all four of you Harry Potter fans and much more for coming on to our program tonight. Uh, uh, not only to help uh, enjoy the 20th anniversary of this phenomenon, but also to educate this host who needs so much education in this field. Jill Kolingowski from San Francisco, Melissa Agnelli from New York City, Vanessa Zoltan, and Matthew Rock. Uh, I shouldn't call you Matthew. You prefer Matt Rocks. Because you do, uh, here in our studio in Toronto. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.